Chapter Eleven, Lucy Westenra's Diary. Twelfth September. How good they all are to me! I quite love that dear Doctor Van Helsing. I wonder why he was so anxious about these flowers. He positively frightened me. He was so fierce, and yet he must have been right, for I feel comfort from them already. Somehow I do not dread being alone tonight, and I can go to sleep without fear. I shall not mind any flapping outside the window. Oh, the terrible struggle that I have had against sleep so often of late, the pain of the sleeplessness, or the pain of the fear of sleep, with such unknown horrors as it has for me. How blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Well, here I am tonight, hoping for sleep, and lying like Ophelia in the play with Virgin Crants and Maiden Strumens. I never liked garlic before, but tonight it is delightful. There is peace in its smell. I feel sleep coming already. Good night, everybody. Doctor Seward's Diary, Thirteen September, called at the Berkeley and found Van Helsing as usual up to time. The carriage ordered from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let's all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. It was a lovely morning. The bright sunshine and the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like a completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colours, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Mrs. Westenra coming out of the morning room. She is always an early riser. She greeted us warmly and said, "You will be glad to know that Lucy is better. The dear child is still asleep." I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, "Aha! I thought I had diagnosed the case." My treatment is working," to which she answered, "You must not take all the credit to yourself, Doctor. Lucy's state this morning is due in part to me." "How do you mean, ma'am?" asked the professor. "Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly, so soundly that even my coming did not wake her. But the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere, and she had actually a bunch of them around her neck." I feared that the heavy odor would be too much for the dear child in her weak state, so I took them all away and opened a bit of the window to let in a little fresh air. You would be pleased with her, I am sure. She moved off into her boudoir, where she usually breakfasts early. As she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen gray. He had been able to restrain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present, for he knew her state and how mischievous a shock would be. He actually smiled on her as he held the door open for her to pass into her room, but the instant she had disappeared, he pulled me suddenly and forcibly into the dining room and closed the door. Then, for the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in some sort of mute despair and then beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally, he sat down on a chair and, putting his hands before his face, began to sob with loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. Then he raised his arms again, as though appealing to the whole universe. "God, God, God," he said, "what have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset? Is there fate among us still sent down from the pagan world of old that such things must be, and in such a way? This poor mother, all unknowing and all for the best as she think, does such thing as lose her daughter body and soul. We must not tell her. We must not even warn her. Then she die." Then both die. Oh, how we are beset! How are all the powers of the devils against us? Suddenly he jumped to his feet. Come, he said. Come, we must see and act. Devils or no devils, or all the devils at once. It matters not. We fight him all the same. We went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. Once again, I drew up the blind while Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time he did not start as he looked on the poor face with the same awful waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured with that hissing inspiration of his, which meant so much. Without a word, he went and locked the door, and then began to set out on a little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognized the necessity and begun to take off my coat. 
but he stopped me with a warning hand. No, he said, today you must operate, I shall provide. You are weakened already. As he spoke, he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again the operation, again the narcotic, again some return of colour to the ashy cheeks, and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched whilst Van Helsing recruited himself and rested. Presently he took an opportunity of telling Mrs. Westenra that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him, that the flowers were of medicinal value, and that the breathing of their odour was a part of the system of cure. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next, and would send me word when to come. After another hour Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright and seemingly not much the worse for her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean? I am beginning to wonder if my long habit of life amongst the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain. Lucy Westenra's Diary 17th September Four days and nights of peace. I am getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It is as if I passed through some long nightmare and had just awakened to see the beautiful sunshine and feel the fresh air of the morning around me. I have a dim half-remembrance of long, anxious times of waiting and fearing, darkness in which there was not even the pain of hope to make present distress more poignant, and then long spells of oblivion and the rising back to life as a diver coming up through the great press of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to frighten me out of my wits, the flapping against the windows, the distant voices which seemed so close to me, the harsh sounds that came from I know not where, and commanded me to do I know not what, have all ceased. I go to bed now without any fear of sleep. I do not even try to keep awake. I have grown quite fond of the garlic, and a boxful arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight Dr. Van Helsing is going away, as he has to be for a day in Amsterdam, but I need not be watched. I am well enough to be left alone. Thank God for mother's sake and dear Arthur's for all our friends who have been so kind. I shall not even feel the change, for last night Dr. Van Helsing slept in his chair a lot of the time. I found him asleep twice when I awoke, but I did not fear to go to sleep again although the boughs or bats or something napped almost angrily against the window-panes. The Paul Mall Gazette, 18 September The Escaped Wolf Perilous Adventure of Our Interviewer Interview with the Keeper in the Zoological Gardens After many inquiries and almost as many refusals, and perpetually using the words Paul Mall Gazette as a sort of talisman, I managed to find the keeper of the section of the zoological gardens in which the wolf department is included. Thomas Bilder lives in one of the cottages in the enclosure behind the elephant house, and was just sitting down to his tea when I found him. Thomas and his wife are hospital folk, elderly, without children, and if the specimen I enjoyed of their hospitality be of the average kind, their lives must be pretty comfortable. The keeper would not enter on what he called business until the supper was over, and we were all satisfied. Then, when the table was cleared, and he had lit his pipe, he said, "'Now, sir, you can go on and ask me what you want. You'll excuse me refusing to talk of professional subjects afore meals. I gives the wolves and the jackals and the hyenas in our section their tea before I begins to ask them questions.' "'How do you mean, ask them questions?' I queried, wishful to get him into a talkative humour. Eating him over the head with a pole is one way. Scratching of their ears is another. When the gents is as flush as want a bit of show off to their gals. I don't much so mind the first. Dating over the pole afore I chucks in their dinner. But I waits till they've had their sherry and coffee, so to speak, afore I try to ear scratching, mind you. He added philosophically. There's a deal of the same nature in us as in them dear animals. Here's you coming and asking me a questions about my business. "'And I dat grumpy like dat only for your bloomin' arf quid. "'I'd a seen you bowed first afore I answer. "'Not even when you arsked me sarcastic like if I'd like you to ask the superintendent "'if you might ask me questions. "'Without offence, did I tell you to go to well?' "'You did. "'And when you'd said you'd report me for using of obscene language "'dat was it me over the ed, but the arf quid made dat all right. "'I weren't a-goin' to fight, so I waited for the food and did with my owl.' "'as the wolves and lions and tigers does. "'But, lore love your art, 
now dat de old ooman has stuck a chunk of her tea cake in me and rinsed me out with her bloomin old teapot and i've lit up you may scratch my ears for all your wort and you won't get even a growl out of me drive along with your questions i know what you're comin at dat dear escaped wolf exactly i want you to give me your view of it just tell me how it happened and when i know the facts i'll get you to say what you consider was the cause of it and how you think the whole affair will end all right governor this year is about de old story dat ere wolf what we called bersicker was one of the tree grey ones that came from norway to jamrex which we bought off him four years ago he was a nice well-behaved wolf dat never gave no trouble to talk of i'm more surprised at him wanting to get out nor any other enemy in de place but there you can't trust wolves no more nor women don't you mind him sir broke in mrs tom with a cheery laugh he's got minded the animal so long that bless if he ain't like no wolf hisself but there ain't no harm in him well sir it was about two hours after feedin yesterday when i first hear my disturbance i was makin up a litter in a monkey house for a young puma which is ill but when i heard the yelpin and owlin i came away straight terrorized bersicker a tearin like a mad thing at the bars as if he wanted to get out there wasn't much people about to day and close at hand there was only one man a tall tin chap with a hook nose and a pointed beard with a few white hairs running through it he had a hard cold look and red eyes and i took a sort of mislike to him for it seemed as if it was him as i was irritated at he had white kid gloves on his ends and he pointed out the animals to me and says keeper these wolves seem upset at something maybe it's you says i for i did not like the airs as he give hisself he didn't get angry as i hoped he would but he smiled a kind of insolent smile with a mouth full of white sharp teeth oh no they wouldn't like me he says oh yes they would says i a imitating of him they always likes a bone or two to clean their teeth about tea time which you was a beg full well it was an odd thing but when the animal see us a talkin they lay down and when i went over to bersicker he let me stroke his ears same as ever that their men came over and bless but if he didn't put his hand and stroke old wolf's ears too take care says i bersicker is quick never mind he says i'm used to him are you in the business yourself i says taking off my hat for a man who trades in wolves and set her as a good friend to keepers no says he not exactly in the business but i have made pets of several and with that he lifts his hat as perlite as a lord and walks away old berserker kept a look and arter him after he was well out of sight and then went to lay down in a corner and wouldn't come out the whole evening well last night as soon as the moon was up the wolves here all became owlin there warn't nothing for them to owl at there warn't no one near except someone that was evidently a cullin a dog somewheres out back the gardings on the park road once or twice i went out to see that all was right and it was and then the owling stopped just before twelve o'clock i just took a look around afore turnin in and bus me but when i came up a set to old berserker's cage i see the rails broken and twisted about and the cage empty and that's all i know for certain did anyone else see anything one of our gardeners was a comin home about that time from armony when he sees a big grey dog comin out through the garding edges or at least so he says but i don't give much for it myself for if he did he never said a word about it to his missus when he got home and it was only after the escape of the wolf was made known and we had been up all night a hunting at the park for berserker that he had remembered seeing anything my own belief is that the armony had got into his head now mr builder can you account in any way for the escape of the wolf well sir he said with a suspicious sort of modesty i think i can but i don't know as how you'd be satisfied with the theory certainly i shall if a man like you who knows the animals from experience can't hazard a good guess at any rate who is even to try well then sir i accounts for it this way it seems to me that here wolf escaped simply because he wanted to get out from the hearty way that both thomas and his wife laughed at the joke i could see that it had done service before and that the whole explanation was simply an elaborate sell i couldn't cope in the bandinage with the worthy thomas but i thought i knew a sure way to his heart so i said now mr bilder we'll consider that first half-sovereign worked off and this brother of his is waiting to be claimed when you've told me what you think will happen right you are sir 
he said briskly. "'You'll excuse me, I know, for a chaffin' of ye, but the old woman here winked at me, which was as much as telling me to go on.' "'Then I never,' said the old lady. "'My opinion is this, that here wolf is a ridin' of somewheres. The gardener, what didn't remember, said he was a gallopin' northward faster than a horse could go, but I don't believe him, for, you see, sir, wolves don't gallop, no more nor dog does. They not bein' built that way. Wolves is fine things in a story-book, and, I'd I say, when they gets in packs and does be chivyin' something, that's more afeard than they is. They can make a devil of a noise and chop it up, whatever it is. But Lord bless you, in real life a wolf is only a low creature, not half so clever or bold as a good dog, and not half a quarter so much fight in him. This one ain't been used to fightin' or even providin' for herself. More like he's somewhere in the park a hidin' and a shifferin' of, if he thinks at all, wonderin' where he is to get his breakfast from, or maybe he's got down some area and is in a coal cellar. My eye, won't some cook get a rum start when he sees his green eyes a-shinin' out at the dark? If he can't get food, he's bound to look for it, and may happy he may chance to light on a butcher's shop in time. If he doesn't, then some nursemaid goes a walkin' orf with the soldier leaving the infant in the permambulator. Well, then I shouldn't be surprised if the census is one babby de less. That's all. I was handing him the half sovereign when something came bobbing against the window, and Mr. Bilder's face doubled in its natural length with surprise. God bless me, he said. If there ain't old Berserk could come back by yourself. He went to the door and opened it, a most unnecessary proceeding, it seemed to me. I have always thought that a wild anima never looks so well as when some obstacle of pronounced durability is between us. A personal experience has intensified rather than diminished that idea. After all, however, there is nothing like custom, for neither Builder nor his wife thought any more of the wolf than I should of a dog. The animal itself was as peaceful and well-behaved as that father of all picture-wolves, Red Riding Hood's quondam friend, whilst moving her confidence in masquerade. The whole scene was an unutterable mixture of comedy and pathos. The wicked wolf, that for half a day had paralysed London and set all the children in the town shivering in their shoes, was there in a sort of penitent mood, and was received and petted like a sort of vulpine prodigal son. Old Bilder examined him all over with the most tender solicitude, and when he had finished with his penitent, said, "'There, I knew the poor old chap would get into some kind of trouble. Didn't I say it all along?' Here's his head all cut and full of broken glass. He's been a-gettin' over some bloomin' wall or other. It's a shame that people are allowed to top their walls with broken bottles. This here's what comes of it. Come along, Bursicker. He took the wolf and locked him up in a cage with a piece of meat that satisfied, in quantity at any rate, the elementary conditions of the fattened calf, and went off to report. I came off, too, to report the only exclusive information that is given today regarding the strange escapade at the zoo. Dr. Seward's Diary 17 September I was engaged after dinner in my study, posting up my books, which, through press of other work and to many visits to Lucy, had fallen sadly into a rear. Suddenly the door was burst open, and in rushed my patient, with his face distorted with passion. I was thunderstruck, for such a thing as a patient getting out of his own accord into the superintendent's study is almost unknown. Without an instant's pause, he made straight at me. He had a dinner-knife in his hand, and, as I saw he was dangerous, I tried to keep the table between us. He was too quick and too strong for me, however, for, before I could get my balance, he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. Before he could strike again, however, I got in my right, and he was sprawling on his back on the floor. My wrist bled freely, and quite a little pool trickled onto the carpet— I saw that my friend was not intent on further effort, and occupied myself binding up my wrist, keeping a wary eye on the prostrate figure all the time. When the attendants rushed in and we turned our attention to him, his employment positively sickened me. He was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up, like a dog, the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured, and, to my surprise, went with the attendants quite placidly, simply repeating over and over again, "'The blood is life! The blood is life!' I cannot afford to lose blood at present. I have lost too much of late for my physical good, and, and the prolonged strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible phases is telling on me. 
I am overexcited and weary, and I need rest, rest, rest. Happily Van Helsing has not summoned me, so I need not forego my sleep. Tonight I could not well do without it. Telegram. Van Helsing, Antwerp, to Seward, Carfax. Sent to Carfax, Sussex, as no county given, delivered late by twenty-two hours. 17 September. Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight. If not watching all the time, frequently visit and see that flowers are as placed. Very important. Do not fail. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Dr. Seward's Diary 18 September Just off for train to London. The arrival of Van Helsing's telegram filled me with dismay. A whole night lost, and I know by better experience what may happen in the night. Of course it is possible that all may be well, but what may have happened? Surely there is some horrible doom hanging over us that every possible accident should thwart us in all we try to do. I shall take this cylinder with me, and then I can complete my entry on Lucy's phonograph. Memorandum Left by Lucy Westenra 17 September, Night I write this and leave it to be seen, so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I am dying of weakness, and have barely strength to write, but it must be done if I die in the doing. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the flowers were placed as Dr. Van Helsing directed, and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which had begun after that sleepwalking on the cliff at Whitby when Mina saved me, and which now I know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, as Dr. Van Helsing said he would be, so that I might have called him. I tried to go to sleep, but could not. Then there came to me that old fear of sleep, and I determined to keep awake. Perversely, sleep would try to come when I did not want it, so, as I feared to be alone, I opened my door and called out, "'Is there anybody there?' There was no answer. I was afraid to wake Mother, and so closed my door again. Then, outside in the shrubbery, I heard a sort of howl like a dog's, but more fierce and deeper. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing except a big bat which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. So I went back to bed again, but determined not to go to sleep. Presently the door opened, and Mother looked in, seeing by my moving that I was not asleep, came in and sat by me. She said to me even more sweetly and softly than her wont, "'I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were all right.' I feared she might catch cold sitting there, and asked her to come in and sleep with me, so she came into bed and lay down beside me. She did not take off her dressing gown— for well, she said she would only stay a while and then go back to her own bed. As she lay there in my arms, and I in hers, the flapping and buffeting came to the window again. She was startled and a little frightened and cried out, "'What is that?' I tried to pacify her and at last succeeded, and she lay quiet, but I could hear her poor dear heart still beating terribly. After a while there was the low howl again, out in the shrubbery, and shortly after there was a crash at the window, and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window blind blew back with the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes there was the head of a great, gaunt, grey wolf. Mother cried out in fright and struggled up into a sitting posture, and clutched wildly at anything that would help her. Amongst the other things she clutched the wreath of flowers that Dr. Van Helsing insisted on my wearing around my neck— and tore it away from me. For a second or two she sat up, pointing at the wolf, and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over, as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. The room and all around seemed to spin round. I kept my eyes fixed on the window, but the wolf drew his head back, and a whole myriad of little specks seemed to come blowing in through the broken window— and wheeling and circling round like the pillar of dust that travellers describe when there is a simoon in the desert. I tried to stir, but there was some spell upon me, and dear mother's poor body, which seemed to grow cold already, for her dear heart had ceased to beat, weighed me down, and I remembered no more for a while. The time did not seem long, but very, very awful, till I recovered consciousness again. Somewhere near a passing bell was tolling, 
and the dogs all round the neighbourhood were howling, and in our shrubbery, seemingly just outside, a nightingale was singing. I was dazed and stupid with pain and terror and weakness, but the sound of the nightingale seemed like the voice of my dead mother come back to comfort me. The sound seemed to have awakened the maids, too, for I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them, and they came in, and when they saw what had happened, and what it was that lay over me on the bed, they screamed out. The wind rushed in through the broken window, and the door slammed to. They lifted off the body of my dear mother, and laid her covered up with a sheet on the bed after I had got up. They were all so frightened and nervous that I directed them to go to the dining-room and have each a glass of wine. The door flew open for an instant and closed again. The maids shrieked and then went in a body to the dining-room, and when I laid what flowers I had on my dear mother's breast, when they were there I remembered what Dr. Van Helsing had told me, but I didn't like to remove them. And, besides, I would have some of the servants to sit up with me now. I was surprised that the maids did not come back. I called them, but got no answer, so I went to the dining-room to look for them. My heart sank when I saw what had happened. They all four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer acrid smell about. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelt of laudanum, and looking on the sideboard I found that bottle which Mother's doctor uses for her— Oh, did use— was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I am back in the room with Mother. I cannot leave her and I am alone, save for the sleeping servants, whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead, I dare not go out, for I can hear the low howl of the wolf through the broken window. The air seems full of specks floating and circling in the draught from the window, and the lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God shield me from the harm this night. I shall hide this paper in my breast, where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother, gone. It is time that I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur, if I should not survive this night. God keep you, dear, and God help me. End of chapter 11